Okay, so here we are in my laundry room again, which can only mean one thing, and that means that I bought yet another animal. And I know I told everybody in my last video I was done buying animals for this year, but you know what? I take none of this responsibility. I blame you guys because you call me up with these amazing animals when you know I'm weak. Um, honey, you know you, you can say no when people offer to sell you something. Oh, oh, so you're insinuating I should take some responsibility for buying more animals? That's exactly what I'm insinuating. Okay, okay well, you know what? That's just crazy talk, and let's just jump into video number 14. Hey guys, really something cool I wanted to show you. In the last video, I showed you this Savu Python. It hadn't shed in the, in the, in the previous video, and it's since shed. And uh, what's really cool is that I was really bummed. As you know, I only hatched that one baby Savu this year. And I thought it was a normal Savu, but after it shed, it's a silver Savu. And the reason it's such a surprise to me is because the mother was a silver, but the father was a normal, which means that the father must be het for silver. When I got him, he was already a year old. So maybe the previous owner maybe changed hands a few times. I have no idea. But the bottom line, so you can see the baby silver. And here's the father. The father is a normal Savu that apparently is het for silver. So anyway, I wanted to show it to you. I was really I was bummed I only had one baby, but you know what? The fact that it turned out to be silver was a pretty awesome surprise. And one more quick thing before we jump into today's video. I want to remind you guys that as far as breeding, of those who are breeding their animals along with me and you're going to follow my schedule, so on daylight savings time, we turned our light back, right? So right now I'm doing 14 hours off and 10 hours on of light. And what I'm also doing, we're in the middle of November right now. Any animal that I plan to breed this season, which means I'm going to start doing my pairing in the beginning of January, I have now stopped feeding those animals. So right now I'm going to let them clean out. Um, they're going to defecate, and then what I'll start doing is like the beginning, the first week of December, I'm going to start to cool those animals down. I'm going to start dropping the nighttime temps just by a few degrees. I'll drop the daytime temps by one or two degrees, and then I'm slowly going to drop those temperatures. And then by the end of December, I'm going to start raising those temperatures again. And then in the beginning of January, I'm going to start feeding those animals, and I'm going to start raising the temps back to normal. So again, I just want to give you guys some pointers and clues what I'm going to be doing, and hopefully we'll both have a lot of success breeding our animals this year. Okay, so let's finally jump into today's video. What are we going to cover? Well, we're going to finish what we started the last video. We're going to do part two of chondro localities. And I think that's going to be really helpful as far as, you know, identifying the type of chondro you have. You're not going to be able to look at your chondros after watching this segment saying, okay, I know exactly where that one is from, but there are four separate groups of chondros, and I'm hoping that at least you can look at your animal and say, okay, based on what Gallery just told me in this video, that looks like it's from Azoria Azoria, or it's Morelia viridis, or it's, uh, or it's uh, Uterensis. So anyway, we're going to get into that. But the first thing we're going to start is, I want to talk about the top three animals Top three specifically green animals, you guys call me about every single day, emails me and IM me, and you're looking for, unfortunately, that nobody seems to be able to get their hands on. The number three animal are northern emerald tree boas. Every day I get, especially since I started doing these videos, every single day I get various messages about, hey, do you have any baby northern emeralds? Now, don't get me wrong, there are more of you out there who probably want basin emeralds over northern emeralds. But it's, there's a huge price difference between the basins and the northern, so I just get a lot less inquir inquiries about the basins. But So these are two female northern emerald tree boas. And I love these two girls. They're sisters. They're coming up on two years old. So why can't we find them? Well, they're, again, just the demand is far more than the supply, right? So most of the people who breed them, um, who keep them, they tend to hold back the babies for themselves. And the ones they don't keep back, uh, they tend to go to people that they know. And um, I tell you, it's the most difficult thing I think of. Uh, I feel bad for new keepers out there, new arboreal keepers trying to find these animals because babies pop up from different sources throughout the year, and you never know. Are they imported babies? Are they captive bred babies? Now, for me, I'm an experienced keeper, so if I bought an imported baby, I don't mind. I can get it going. But if you're a newer keeper and you see a northern baby on the tree boa, um, if it's not feeding, I can I promise you you're gonna have a really difficult time getting that animal feeding. So if I were you and somebody was selling a baby, you know, northern emerald tree bow and you were interested in buying it, I don't think it's that out of line for you to say to the seller, hey, can you send me a videotape of it eating? I don't think that's a you know a bad thing to ask at all. Um, and if they get annoyed with you and they say, no, I'm not going to send you a videotape, you'd be best suited to pass on that animal because the last thing you want to do is you want to get yourself a baby northern emerald tree bow that is not feeding because if you're a newer keeper, I promise you, you're going to have a really difficult time 
going to get feeding. Hey, you know what? I also thought it was worth mentioning in this video, a call I get all the time in email is, where do I get my purchase from? People watch the videos and they see my purchase. Specialty Enclosure Designs, okay, my friend David Brahms. David makes all these purchases for me. This is my hatchling rack for baby emeralds and baby chondros. As the animals grow, I put them in my 12-quart rubber maze. As you can see, David makes them perfect to size, legless. Or if you have the Cambro box style for your yearling animals, again, David makes that for me. And something I love to do that a lot of people, I don't see them using that much, is here's my ARS rack. And when I have like yearling carpets or any yearling arboreal snake that's not an emerald or a chondro, I have these perches in there for them, which David also makes. And the thing that's great about David is not only is he super professional, but he's a breeder, so he gets it. So if you tell him exactly what you have, the animal that you have, and what you're trying to accomplish, he'll make recommendations for you. And I just can't speak highly enough of David and his purchase. So again, specialty enclosure designs. I will put a link on the bottom of my video to his Facebook page. And uh, good luck getting your purchase from David. Chondro Localities Part 2. Um, for Part 1, go back and watch my previous video where I cover Morelia Azoria Pulcher and Morelia Azoria Azoria. So let's kick this one off with Morelia Viridis, Viridis which is the easiest group of chondros to uh, identify. And again, like I mentioned in the first video, if you want to see where these animals are specifically from, you can go look at a map. What I want to talk really about are phenotypes and what, you know, what the animals look like, because that's really what we mostly care about, right? So there are three types, are uh, three animals within Morelia viridis, and those are the Australian chondros, which look just like a maruki. I'm going to put pictures of these animals up for you guys, which is that green animal with a solid stripe going down its vertebrae. doesn't always have a solid stripe, but some variation of a stripe. So it's easy to remember the Australian ones because we don't see them here in the United States, right? You can't export anything out of Australia. So if you see anything with a stripe down its back that resembles a Australian type, we know that it is actually a Maruki type, which again, I'm going to put pictures up for you guys. I'm also going to put a picture up of an albino Maruki up that was owned by Damon Solsees. I don't know if that animal is still alive or not. Okay, so that's two of the three. The third one is the most common one we see, which is the Aru type of chondro. And again, so you have Australian, you have Maruki, and you have Aru. They're all three are Maruki. Morelia viridis, and all three of these animals are only born as yellow babies, okay? There is no such thing as a red Aru baby, and there's no such thing as a red Maruki baby. Um, so again, I'm going to put pictures up of all these animals for you guys, and I, I think I didn't do on my first video, I want to make sure I say it now, is that uh, I want to thank Matt Morris, who uh, he put a site up on Facebook. It's Locality Chondros, I think that's the name of it. There's a bunch of pictures there, and he was kind enough to let me use a lot of those photos. And again, Ryan Young, who helped me a great deal with the segment that I did on this video, uh, that I'm doing on this video and my previous video on Chondro Locality. So again, that covers Morelia viridis, and uh, let's jump into the next Chondro Locality type. Okay, so this is the second most requested animal that you guys want. Um, that you contact me about constantly and email me, call me about. And I feel so privileged to get this animal today. I'm um, really excited to open it and I'm going to show you guys what this is. And I want to thank my friend Ross Adcock out in California for think of, thinking of me and sending me one of his holdback females. And I know you guys are going to love this animal. And yeah, it's pretty incredible. So the second most requested animals that you guys are looking for is, uh, this is a baby green Sanzinia. Uh, this is a little female, 2020 female. She's a few months old. She's feeding really well. And so if you'd see my previous video about Madagascar trees, boas, or Sanzinia, um, you'll know why you can't get them. But the bottom line is CITES protected. They can't be exported out of their own countries. They cannot be imported into the United States. There's very few people working with them, and those who work with them tend to hold back older babies. And even when they have babies, they, uh, they are not consistent breeders. They have small litters, and it just makes them difficult to get their holes. Uh, makes it difficult for you to get your hands on them. So anyway, that's the number two second most requested animal that people are looking for and why we're not able to get them. That's a green Sanzinia. <laughs> Okay, the fourth and final, thank God, locality of conjure we're going to talk about, the fourth subspecies is Morelia azoria uh, uterensis. The word uterensis means from the north. It means from the north area of uh, Indonesia or Papua New Guinea. What do these animals have in common? Well, 
They all have white or green tail tips, uh, not black tail tips, and they all are capable of having either yellow or red neonates. Um, I've been really, this is, this is a confusing one for me, guys. I'll tell you this whole Uterensis group. Um, certain animals I could kind of look at and tell you what it is, but I think, again, I wanted to say one last time, the goal of my video is you're not going to be able to look at your animal and say, oh my God, I reckon that is definitely a Lyra or definitely uh, you know, uh, a Wamina, but you're going to be able to say, okay, based on the characteristics and based on the phenotype, I know that's a Uterensis animal, meaning from the north, uh, based on you know, everything we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about the very first three Uterensis, and they are Lyras, Jayapura, and Yapen. And I'm going to put pictures of all those animals on the screen right now. And again, when you're looking at them, you see they're all very similar, which is why if you have any one of those three animals and you weren't there personally to collect it, it's almost impossible to tell you exactly where that animal is from. But again, you can at least look at one of these three animals, the Lyra, the Jayapura, or the Yapen, and say, okay, I know these animals are Uterensis, so uh, that's the first three localities we're going to jump talk about. Let's get into the next ones of Uterensis. Cyclops and Arso locality animals. I don't think I've ever really seen an Arso. I know they exist. I couldn't even find pictures of an Arso on the internet, so I'm going to put a picture up of a Cyclops animal for you. Uh, Cyclops are one of those animals similar to like an Aru type, where when I see a, a, um, a Cyclops type, it just, the, the phenotype is pretty consistent. Again, if you look at the picture of the uh, of the uh, cyclops animal I have uh, posted. It's, those are pretty consistent looking animals. So typically, yeah, that is one of the few localities where you can look at and say, okay, based on everything we know, that looks to be um, a cyclops animal. Again, as far as the Arso, no picture guys. If anybody has a picture they can share with me or email to me, I'd love to see it because I couldn't find one online. Carabega, I'm gonna put the spelling on the bottom of this because I'm sure I'm not saying it correctly. So it's Cara, Carabega. It's Bocondinis and Waminas make up the last three locality types within Uterensis. This one's particularly confusing for me, guys, and I'm going to tell you why. Is that um, over the last few years, I think they're also st almost starting to classify these three localities as pretty much the same animal. They're not even differentiating between those three locality types anymore. What was once a Bocondini or was once a Wamina, I think they're just all calling them, or, or Carabega type, they're all calling them, I guess they're calling them Waminas now. And the reason that's confusing is because from what I was told like 10, 15 years ago is that chondros do not even exist in Wamina. Isn't this fun, guys? Is it just so confusing? The, what was happening, though, is that it's a major export city, Wamina. So chondros were actually coming out of Wamina. And by the time they were getting to U.S. and other countries, they were being listed as Wamina locality types because that's where they were being shipped from. But they weren't actually found within the Wamina, the city of Wamina. So, again, this stuff is all confusing. I'm going to put pictures up of all three of these animals on the screen. Speaking to my friend Garrick G. Garrick, I don't know how to say your last name. I'm so sorry. You know, Garrick has a beautiful blue Wamina animal, which, again, I'm going to put a picture up. And his animal has a black tail, which kind of goes against everything I said earlier, right? Because I said that all Uterensis animals either have a white tail tip or a green tail tip, and yet his Wamina has a black tail tip. So I'm trying my best to make this a little less confusing. I know how confusing it is, but I think what it comes down to is just that a lot of there's, these are animals. They're live creatures, and there's a lot of inconsistencies. The best we could do is kind of look at a phenotype and, and just get an idea of where these animals might be from or which subspecies it might be, and I think that's the best we're going to be able to do unless we're there in a specific city ourselves to collect those animals. So I hope this all helped, guys. I know it helped me a lot. Okay, so what is the number one green snake you guys call me about or email me about and IM me about on a daily basis? Well, of course, it's green tree pythons. Everybody's looking for green tree pythons, uh, specifically anything that is not Aru type, which seems to be the most readily available right now. That's going to change also, though. I promise you, you watch over the next few years, it's going to be tougher even to find Biak green tree pythons. But these are Manicori types, and you can see down here below, this is my class of 2020, some of the babies I held back. But again, Top three animal you get called about. This is the number one most in-demand animal that you guys contact me for, green tree pythons, and why can't you find them? Well, um, as I mentioned in a previous video, which I will link down below, the top three reasons you cannot find green tree pythons these days, especially captive bred and born green tree pythons, is we lost two icons with green tree pythons uh, breeders over the past five years, and then we also had to deal with nidovirus, right? So those three things, and again, for more details, I'm going to put that link to that video, but that's really the, the biggest problem with green tree pythons. Demand is, uh, is incredible. The supply has been low. I'm hoping that changes over the next few years as more people are working with them and breeding them. I know in my case, I breed a lot of them and I keep a lot of them back. Um, I sell very few of my animals, which doesn't help to, you know, 
uh, put more animals in the market. But in any event, I promise everybody out there, be patient. Over the next few years, you're going to see a lot more animals being born and be made available. But uh, again, green tree pythons are by far the number one animal that I have in the most demand, this, most that I get calls for that unfortunately that people are just not able to get their hands on. Okay, guys, so thanks so much for watching another video of mine, and uh, happy Thanksgiving. I'm going to see everybody in two weeks, but before I go, U.S. Ark, they do so much for us and ask so little from us, so please make sure that you contribute to them. It's only $5 a month, and I have some really cool videos, guys, coming up in the next few weeks. I'm trying to get some remote stuff going, but with COVID, it's making it tough, but I promise I have a lot of really cool things in mind. But in any event, thanks again for watching, and I'm going to see everybody in a couple of weeks. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?